Well, today we've got Brian Thomas. Now, Brian, I believe you're head of retail funds um, for Perennial Investment Partners. And I understand you've been with Perennial around 10 years and some 37 years in the financial markets. Now, we like people who've had a bit of experience because <laughs> they've been through a few cycles. But is that a fair assumption of where you've, what you've been doing? Yeah, well, I've been through, um, I do remember 87 very clearly. Um, I do remember uh, what happened in 94, for example, as negative periods um, in the market. And I think that gives you a good view because you're there experiencing it and you understand not just from a textbook or whatever what's happened. Yeah. And my parents are old enough, which is, I, I don't talk to people a lot about, to remember the Great Depression and the true stories of what happened in terms of unemployment and difficulties in those days as well. So it gives you a reasonable perspective. So, uh, look, we, we, you're, you're based in Sydney and uh, Perennial's a large fund manager over there and got a number of funds. But what we've seen recently in the markets is, is we've seen the markets hit new highs. And, and, and clearly, that, a lot of that's been driven um, initially recovery from being over uh, of the GFC and people overdone, if you like, oversold. Mm -hmm. But now, of course, a lot of it's been done, uh, driven by the need for a return, particularly people looking for dividends because of the low interest rate environment. So just quickly, and I know it's a subject one could take hours, but quickly, what do you see of the current environment? Well, I think you're, I think you're right. I think you hit the nail on the head, Ian. I think um, low interest rates are driving everything. I think fundamentally, we can talk about QE techni technically, we can talk about lots of different things in the economy, we can go around the world. But there's one big theme, and it is driving everything. And it's, it's two things. One, low interest rates, but more importantly from an economic point of view and an investment point of view, expectations of low interest rates staying low for a long time. So the 10-year bond rate in, in Australia, for example, being 2.36% this morning, very, very low. Interest rates here and in Oz being very low and around the world being near zero. And even with the US increasing interest rates, maybe September, um, rates are still incredibly low. And if people believe rates are going to stay low for a long time, it does, does some important things to asset prices. It bumps up the prices of uh, prices you get a high of, of assets that you get a high yield from. Property prices usually go up, and we know that in, in Auckland and we know that um, in Sydney and also shares. So fundamentally there's been a shift upwards in terms of the, the prices of growth assets because people want a higher yield, but also because interest rates are expected to be so low, so the price of assets go up. So I think that's the biggest thing happening in the world. The big question is how long will that last? Well, well that was going to be my way I was going. <laughs> how long? And, and of course no one knows exactly, but it does appear as though interest rates will, are going to stay lower for longer. Mm. I do think the reality is that when we saw the big improvement from the GFC, you know, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. Mm. So all equity prices were repriced. And my view now is that we're going to see a, 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 a gap in my, a, a emerge yep. around the, comp the good companies that have got genuine growth and genuine, genuine business cases and can cope in the new environment as against just the others that don't make it. And, that, and, and that's going to be quite significant. Which brings me to the point is, I think it's really important that we use active management and we use some risk techniques around how we might protect investors' money because they are concerned. Mm. And that's why some of them are still sitting on the sideline. A lot of money on the sideline. What's your view? Well, there's a lot in that. There's a lot in, in, that, in that question. It's a big question. Um, I think the market up until now, in, from the GFC, a lot of the growth has been driven by cost cutting, um, and a lot of the growth hasn't been driven by top line growth. And there is a disparity now between good companies that can grow the revenues from here, because you can only cut costs so far, yep. in a very general sense, again, yep. a simple sense, but it is true. And you've got to now pick which companies can, can grow their earnings, but we're, we're fundamentally a value manager, are also good value. So if you can do that, you'll do very well. So I think active manage work, management works both in fixed interest and both in equities at the moment in particular. And the second thing I think, you know, which is um, something we've been thinking about, something we're doing a lot of work on at Perennial, we brought a risk management team inside Perennial 
of people that understand how to manage risk, particularly equity risk, um, because we think that people want to think about, okay, I want some money in equities because it's the only place to get a decent yield, but I don't really want all the downsides. So risk management's very important, active management very, very important. And with that, you've of course just launched an, and have a new fund, the Perennial Wealth Defender or Value Wealth Defender mm -hmm. series. And um, of course, recently we did a video of one of your people it was um, Scott Stewart, and that is on our web for anybody to look at. But that's going well because I do I do like that idea. Oh, th thanks, Ian. That's going very well. Um, it's it's hitting. We call it. We say it solves the investor's dilemma, and the investor's dilemma is. I want to get a reasonable yield and a reasonable total return. So in the Australian share market over 130 years, the yield has been, or the total return has been 11.5% compound, which is fantastic. 11.5% compound over 130 years. But then who has a 130 year time horizon? I was just going to say, do you remember those times, Brian? But I wouldn't be so rude, but there you go. Uh, I haven't been in the industry that long, but all I'm saying is the Australian share market has been one of the best performing markets in the world. And in fact, there's a, there's a survey done uh, over 114 years I'm talking in very long num uh, old, uh, numbers now, that the Australian share market was the best performing of the major share markets of all world share markets. And it's good to beat the Kiwis in something because um, we don't tend to do it in rugby enough, but the Kiwi market was the fourth uh, best performing global market. So um, you want that return, but you don't want the risk. And, and this just employs some pretty advanced risk management techniques to try to protect at least half of any big fall. So the market falls, substantially overnight uh, or over six months then we protect a lot of that we cushion a lot of it uh, but still yeah. give people the upside so that's what we're trying to do which we think is quite innovative yeah no i i think there's a good place for it it's like putting some insurance across it exactly. and and i can't let those comments about new zealand australia go we're, <laughs> you might be number one but if we're number four look out because there's only one way you can go but we'll see like, you at the but, Rugby but, but, World Cup. Well, and, and, and also even in the league last night, I, I, I do think that the, uh, the Rabbitohs got a wee bit of a chance. In. But these things do happen. These things do happen. So, look, finally, because we haven't got a lot of time, but uh, and there are a lot of subjects we could touch mm -hmm. on, the Australian economy, of course, was built up and did very, very well when the, when the, in the uh, mega boom series for resources, which clearly is over at the States. Mm -hmm. The demand for China has levelled off or has dropped off. There's some big stockpiles around. There's some major changes going on in that industry globally, not just Australia. However, the reliance Australia had on those resources clearly drove the Australian dollar higher. And we've now seen it come back. We've seen the American economy really recover and seem, looks like it's starting to go well in a lot of areas now. To me, the chances are the Australian, the American dollar will strengthen from where it is now. How do you see that happening? Where do you see the Australian-American cross rate? No, oh, okay, good question. Um, on any economic model, uh, short, sorry, let's, I'll say one thing uh, sh before I go, uh, talk about the longer term. Predicting currency short term is very hard. Yep. Very, very hard. Long term, fundamentally, the Australian dollar is overvalued. Um, there was an economist calling it down to 50 cents in the next two years. I think that's wrong. Um, I think it's more likely to be in the 60s, late 60s, maybe 69, 68 cents in, say, the next two years' time. Because fundamentally, with commodity prices falling so much um, and our interest rates where, they're, where they are, we think that um, the Aussie dollar will be very weak from here. So that's an, an, an important thing. And I think you might see a little bit of that probably in May. There's a good chance although every, all the economists said the same thing in April, so we, 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 we can be wrong <laughs> a lot of the time, but I think there's a good chance that Aussie um, interest rates might go down to 2%, and if the US starts to think about rising interest rates, that'll push the Aussie dollar down even more. So I think from here, the Aussie dollar going down, and by the way, there's some good technical research that shows that an economy that goes through a resources boom, the only way they can, this is why the Reserve Bank is obsessed with a lower Aussie dollar, the only way they can get back to a great economy again is for their currency to fall. And then things like tourism do well, their manufacturing industry <coughs> re recovers. Um, and you can see that you know tourism is going very well, education is, is going well, but it needs a lower Aussie dollar to get us back post that resources boom. So hopefully um, we can do well. And I mean, the NZ, NZ economy is doing actually probably a little bit better. It's a bit more broad based. And hopefully we can recover from that resources boom. But the Aussie market, 
and the Aussie economy has always bounced back over years and years and years. So it's, I th- I'm confident it's going to do it again. Well, you know, you touch on that, and I, I think you're right about the US Australian dollar. Um, and I think when we look at it compared to the New Zealand dollar, while I agree with you that it's very difficult to predict short term moves in, in currency, it does appear as though the New Zealand dollar could just appreciate even more against the Australian dollar than now and go through parity. So maybe there's just another little area we may just have a little win on our, uh, <laughs> uh, against the Australians. But look, thank you very much for your time. Um, just to reiterate again, we do support the Wealth Defender series. We think that putting some insurance across a part of a portfolio is very sound and we do like what Perennial have done there and as I said we did do the video with Scott on it for anybody who wants to watch it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you Ian.